afternoon to our next speaker, uh, to John Nelson uh, from the University of Wollongong. Uh, and his paper is entitled Aggregate Variation in the South in Lenses. Please welcome John. Well, first, uh, thanks very much. I appreciate the opportunity to talk here. Um, I live and work in Groningen, which is at the 53rd northern parallel. So I may be the most northern speaker in uh, that sense, uh, that way. Uh, I'll, I'll talk to uh, competitors at any rate. And I do have a, a sort of methodological point I'd like to make in this talk today. It continues other papers now that I've tried to work out in the Lancet's data. And what I'd really like to say is that the techniques that we're using, the numerical analysis techniques, give you a view of what an aggregate difference is from one dialect, one variety to another. And that that's something that really belongs in the arsenal of analytical techniques that we need in studying language variation. But that's going to be the overall theme. So I've said that much. I will, I will focus on the self, so I promise. So I've said that's going to be my overall theme, sorry. Um, I, I think that detailed studies of single features, even ones like I versus A, ah, A versus A, ah, and are at best inconclusive and at worst misleading. Why is that? It's partly because you're taking from such a, a huge wealth of possibilities um, the, the particular uh, features that could be characteristic that you're really not uh, testing whether the overall varieties are very different. They're, after all, going to differ in any number of ways, which I'll try to make it as a bigger point later. And I think I'm following up a tradition of reflection on dialectology that at least Kuzieriu uh, started. He's a Tübingen uh, professor of general linguistics, but he studied dialectology and what he called language geography quite a lot. He warned that the studies can degenerate into a kind of atomism, where you know everything about what, where the word pale is pronounced and where it isn't, but you miss the bigger picture of what's going on with language variety. After all, language is an incredibly multi-variable, multi-dimensional phenomenon. You need some way of looking at the way that someone speaks in a given variety, or the way, sorry, the way that someone, the uh, way that given variety is expressed, the whole panoply of language habits and choices that are made in an area in order to make sense of it. Now, when I've given this talk before, people often object, because, and I think correctly, by the way, that aggregate is not what they're interested in. They really want to know the details. And I'm quite sympathetic to that. My, my method isn't to forget the details, but to try to interpret them in, uh, on the basis of, or against the background of, an aggregate difference, as you'll see. And I'll try to e emphasize here that, or by giving an example, of the southern vowels, um, that we can aggregate at different levels. We don't have to take a completely global view of the differences we're looking at. This is the outline of my talk, then I'll start with a kind of rhetorical question. I'll show you an aggregating technique that we're using now to understand pronunciation differences. Um, I'll show you an experiment on southern vowels in Lampsus, different ways we've tried to develop to look at what we're getting by aggregating these views, um, and then some reflections on the, on the process. So the rhetorical question then is, what's the right level of aggregation for variation studies that should be not variant for variation studies? The most popular one is certainly allophonic. We look at R's versus schwa's, I's versus A's, A's versus A. But remember, um, there's about 50 phonemes or so in a language, and there's usually about four variants per phoneme. It gives you a big choice. If you're doing that, you probably haven't got a general theory of how variation is being expressed. You look at lexical choice, obviously. Morph and these are from Lampsus, all these examples. Uh, morphological choice as well, syntactic construction choice. Um, if you want to get make it even richer, you start adding frequency to all of this and making it even more complex. And we know that people do express um, their identity, their uh, linguistic identity, the, one, the region or class or whatever they, they associate themselves with, with these different measures. But it's going to be I mean, I, I trust that view, but I'd also like to back it up with a view that says that I haven't picked out one of these things that accidentally seems to fit. Right? I'd like to interpret that in terms of the, the whole set of speech habits that someone has. So I'm going to look at ways of aggregating this. The, I think I'm continuing work 
by uh, Chong Siki and Hans Kirvel, especially, uh, focusing on collecting lots of features and treat, but they always focused on qualitative variables, that something was the same or different. But I'm going to make, I'm going to use here a measure of pronunciation difference, a Levenstein distance, and it's, it's going to give me a way to, pronun to measure pronunciation difference at a numeric level, and therefore not a, just a qualitative level. In other words, now the big advantage being that if I can characterize the pronunciation difference between a set of words, a number for each, I can sum those but in a way that qualitative variables don't let me do. I'm going to collect a random sample of pronunciation of the same word. That's a big uh, phrase, because actually I'm going to use Lanza's data. So it's as random as the Lanza's data is and no more. Uh, I don't have any way of collecting that data otherwise. And I'm going to sum it, as I said. Um, I'll start out by having characterizing segment distance, and I've, we've experimented with lots of ways of doing this. A simple way is to characterize uh, the sounds you're interested in in terms of features somehow, and then measure the difference between one sound and another as a difference in those features. So this is a way taken from Fierega and Cucchiarini, and a way it was developed to test how well uh, transcribers were doing who were transcribing speech for training speech recognition systems. It's not too unlike um, the task which we're interested in dialectology. They're asking how well did those trans how close were the transcribers to the actual speech? And they were trying to figure out which one's the highest, the student assistant work. That's how they developed it first. But we've experimented with other feature systems as well, one developed by Almeida and uh, Angelica Brown and Lapor. Uh, we've also experimented with the Trump and Alley system. It didn't work quite as well as the other, but not badly. We also worked with measuring based on spectrograms from the House and Wells tape of the sound of the IPA. Um, the, the good news is that we don't see huge differences in results based on this. There's a kind of stability here that uh, means that we can go on from here. Now, the Levenstein distance is defined as the cost of the least costly set of operations that maps one string into another. There's another example from Lamps that's deliberately sort of reversed from the way you usually think of it. But if I wanted to transform the southern pronunciation uh, afternoon, into a more northern pronunciation, afternoon, uh, then I could do that by first uh, deleting a schwa, as I, as I do here. But that's going to be associated with a certain cost, which I'm going to measure as the, the distance um, between the schwa and the silence. I'm going to insert an R. I'm going to also measure the distance between the, the, the R and the silence and assign a cost to that. And finally, I'm going to replace the, uh, the front uh, ooh with, a, with a back ooh and I'm going to associate a particular cost with that, and I'm going to sum it. So that's going to be the way to map one sound into another. There's an efficient algorithm that does this. I'm not going to try to explain it now in the interest of, of time, but um, we have a, a web demonstration up uh, in growing and showing you how to do this. You can type in um, pronunciations or letters or sounds. I mean, this is an algorithm that's used for sequence distance in bird songs, in macromolecules, in, in uh, genetics, in lots of other things. Um, so it's a, <clears throat> a common enough algorithm. Um, basically, the way it works is you start from the upper left, and you, you can always fill in as long as everything up and to the left is already been filled in. And you find a path down to the lower right-hand corner, and that path will let you trace back the operations that led to that least costly set of operations, mapping one string to another. 